this time, I think it's more discussion. And so I agree with you. I, I personally would not make a motion on this agenda item, along with discussion. Any other comment from anyone on the board? So my question is, is this is something I was looking at. So who, who was proposed, proposed this? Who was it proposed by? This was a discussion that we had on the last a board meeting March. Uh, about to uh, uh, try to help new graduates with expense and spreading out the time considering we were thinking about you know raising the the fees so uh, we brought it back this time as an agenda item to take a look at that makes sense thank you any Comment from people in the audience relative to this idea. Having, having no public comment and having no motion. Alan. Oh, yes. Sorry. That's OK, Alan. Um, I would like to see us pursue this and um, perhaps discuss it further today, because after we've just raised their, the dues, um, it, it's hard, because a lot of these students have $60,000 in debt to become a respiratory care practitioner. And I think um, if we want to help them out in this one time when they start, I think it's a good idea because they're coming in, like I said, with a lot of debt, a lot of initial bills, and no, no job to help pay for them. And this, this would help them swallow the pill of the increased dues. Um, so I'm personally for it as someone it would affect. And I think we need to look at it as someone, I mean, I'm not a new person, obviously, but, um, I'm a respiratory care practitioner, and I, I understand the amount of debt people are now going into to become a respiratory therapist. So I, I would be in favor of it, but I would like to at least discuss it. May I, may I make a suggestion that we come back and revisit it annually? And perhaps, and I don't see it happening anytime soon, but it may be feasible in four to five years. But we can look at it every year and just keep it remind. I, I think that's that's important. The staff spent a lot of time putting the detail together about how this will negatively affect the board right now. And, uh, you know, it's a big negative uh, chunk of dollars that uh, the board would not collect over time and put us really into the negative down to just about a half a point six months of reserve, which would not keep us as a viable organization. So although the, the germ of the idea is positive, the negative impact right now of doing this at, at this point in time will be, you know, not only offset what we're doing relative to the registration fee, the fees, but will negatively impact our whole viability of the board to be able to function in its correct way. So I, I, do, I do agree that we can revisit this idea uh, a, as we see, as budgets change, as dollars change, and to see whether or not this could be a viable alternative down the road. Uh, for us could we possibly revisit it maybe not go from the 25 to 36 months but maybe go from 25 to 30 kind of meet it halfway well I, I mean if we can re revisit I, mean, I understand we need to keep the board going I understand the importance of that of course <coughs> but I, I would just like to see some kind of um, help for these the new RTs that are coming in yes I, I'm not sure if um, as Stephanie said, is that well, I, you want to get into the details today, we can, but I think it's a topic that we should revisit periodically with more discussion after we get comment. And I think it says here we can re request public comment and further input. So I'm not sure if today's the day we want to hash all this out and just keep it alive is more, I think, what the flavor of this was, discussion. Stephanie, if I got that correct. Uh, 
I, I'm just trying to respect what the board had asked at the, the last meeting. There, there was a concern, a valid concern, and so I was just trying to present the facts for you to determine which, which direction. As staff, I recommend that we do not pursue this now, and I don't see it as a viable option in the near future. But I still think it's a very worthy idea. I have a point of clarification. Am I to understand that even with the increase in fees, if we increase the length of time for new RCPs to renew, that we'd be down to a half a month surplus? Correct. Thank you. There is a, there is a chart on uh, uh, page three of, of the agenda item that that shows very clearly the negative effect over time, the way that we've, uh, with the fee increases and where that will do uh, us for clarification, and the red that's on, on that paper. Uh, again, I think that uh, respectfully looking at ways to help you know, new RCPs is is admirable, but viability currently of the board is tenth amount to the 20 plus thousand respiratory care practitioners of the state, and I think that uh, we have to weigh both of those things together. And we can revisit this. We can put it, you know, on the agenda again and hash out those details you know, particularly after the, the increases thought to go into effect in the budget year changes and see where we are relative to the projections and see whether or not that has changed at all and whether or not we can actually look to actually accomplish that detail. Any more comment from the audience or other board members? If not, I will uh, move on to item five and have a discussion relative to our legislation of interest and our possible action and support. Yes, with regard to this item, wanted to bring to your attention uh, Assembly Bill 387 and Assembly Bill 391 um, that were identified as potential legislation of interest following the March board meeting. And so in accordance with board policy, uh, we reached out to the executive committee. Um, they were made aware of the bills and they approved the positions um, as noted on the first sheet here. So at this point, I'll give you an update about each of those bills and then determine whether or not the board wants to ratify the positions recommended by the executive committee or come up with another uh, either support, oppose, support if amended or oppose unless amended. Um, AB 387 in essence directly conflicted with our statute it was it was a proposal to require facilities to pay at minimum wage to any student who is performing clinical uh, part of their clinical rotation in the facilities um, there is something within coarc standards that says that you cannot be paid for clinical so there you know there was the direct conflict with our statute being that we have coarc as a, one of the required approvers for the respiratory programs um, for that reason an opposed position was taken um, i will update you to say that it the bill was amended so that it now states that if you work more than a, or you perform more than a hundred clinical hours at the facility you are then determined to be an employee i don't know how helpful that is because i do believe all of the programs are more than a hundred hours um, but also as a notation the uh, file didn't uh, the bill did not make it out of the house of origin so because this is the first year of a two-year cycle it is currently inactive but it may become a two-year bill we will continue to follow that next year and ab391 um, was definitely something that we had it took a supportive amended or that's what was recommended um, it has to do with asthma education and there were just a few concerns we had and stephanie and i met with the author's office um, a few times since the, we uh the bill became on our radar uh, basically we wanted to ensure that respiratory therapists were not going to be required to um, 
meet any additional training requirements because this is obviously part of the scope of practice. Um, we also looked at possibly have them to be included as supervisors for the training that's offered to the, these individuals. However, at this time, they said they were only going to limit it to direct billing, those that have direct billing access, which are physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. So we kind of tried to push for that. Um, and lastly, we made a recommendation that AARC's asthma educator course um, be recognized, and we have since provided the criteria for that course, and it sounds like while they're not listing specific courses, it does appear that the curriculum from AARC's course will meet those requirements. So it will be a viable option for those that are seeking that training. Now that was a lot of information, if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Yeah, a motion to ratify if you're in agreement or a motion to for another position if on those two. So I, I will make a motion that we ratify the positions that were just explained and up, approved by the executive committee. Second. So, any comment from anyone from the floor? Having no discussion from the floor, any discussion from the board? Finding no discussion, let us have a, a, a vote on the motion, please. Okay. Mary Ellen Early? Aye. Rebecca Franzoya? Aye. Mark Goldstein? Aye. Michael Hardiman? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Judy McKeever? Aye. Sam Kabusha? Aye. Vice President Wagner? Aye. And President Roth? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll move on to, uh, uh, before we finish item five, is there any other, uh, there are several bills that are listed here which uh, we're, we were either on the watch or opposed to. Is there any uh, member of the board who would like some more information from the staff relative to any of these bills? Any comment about any of the bills from the floor? Having no comment from the floor and no further comment from the board, we'll move on to the next agenda item, the workforce study presentation. President Roth, would it be okay if we went ahead and took a break? Our, our present presenter's not here. He's, he was scheduled to appear at 930. And um, so hopefully within 15 minutes, he okay. will be here and have a chance to get set up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and for everyone that's new, there is right when you get out into the security area, there is a little cafe over there. You can buy little things. <laughs> okay. We will take a 15 minute break. Building. <laughs> Thank you. for your industrious work and your thoroughness in presenting this. So thank you, and the floor is yours. <clears throat> uh, do you want me to change the title there to 2017? <laughs> <laughs> I think of the work of having been mainly done in 2016, so that's why I slapped that year on it. But anyway, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to make this presentation of findings from the 2016-17 California Respiratory Care Workforce Study. My name is Tim Bates. I'm with the Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California. I am the lead author uh, on this study. I know I have just 30 minutes for presentation, so no doubt I'll end up glossing over some findings, uh, but uh, my understanding is we'll have some time following uh, for discussion. <clears throat> uh, 
I'll start with a quick overview of the study's research objectives and component parts and touch just a little bit on methodology. Uh, the bulleted list uh, represents the principal research topics addressed by the study. We focused on trying to understand the key issues in each of these topical areas. Uh, what are the critical issues around uh, the organization of students' supervised clinical experiences? How well are our new RT graduates prepared to enter the workforce in terms of clinical skill and knowledge? Is there support for shifting RT education to the baccalaureate level? Uh, what is driving that support? Alternatively, what is driving resistance to that shift? How widespread is the use of therapist-driven protocols, and is there support for granting RTs the authority to evaluate and treat per protocol? Is there a support for establishing continued education core content, in other words, content areas that all RTs are required to complete regardless of their clinical practice area? Uh, additional research questions included. What are the differences between entry-level bachelor's degree and associate degree programs in terms of curricular content? Looking at accreditation standards, how do the stated competencies and minimum curricular content requirements in entry-level respiratory, entry respiratory therapy education compare with those outlined in baccalaureate level registered nursing? physician assistant, physical therapy, and nurse practitioner programs. And finally, is there any scholarly evidence that explores the relationship between the type of respiratory therapy degree earned and patient outcomes? Um, this study was conducted over an 18-month period between July 2015 and December 2016 and included several component parts. We conducted 10 key informant interviews with directors of respiratory care services. Findings from these interviews were then used to develop a survey instrument that was fielded to directors of respiratory care services across the state. We conducted 10 key informant interviews with directors of respiratory therapy education programs, representing both public and private for-profit institutions. The directors we interviewed included the one entry-level BSRT program in California, Loma Linda, as well as one of the programs taking part in the community college system's bachelor's degree pilot program. We conducted focus groups with 40 currently employed respiratory therapists who do not work in a director slash managerial role. Uh, these were mainly phone-based interviews, but we did do two sessions in person before we uh, learned our hard lesson that it's very, very difficult to get RTs to show up to an in-person focus group. Uh, we used detailed descriptions of course content to perform a content analysis of uh, comparing the curriculum of Loma Linda University's entry-level BSRT program with a well-regarded associate degree program in the community college system we used accreditation standards to perform a comparative analysis of expected competencies and minimum curricular content requirements in entry-level respiratory therapy education programs with those of baccalaureate nursing, physician assistant, physical therapy, and nurse practitioner programs. Finally, we conducted a review of academic literature to identify any scholarly work addressing whether the type of degree earned by a respiratory therapist has any bearing on patient outcomes. And let me just uh, say quickly, the answer to that question is no. Um, so I'm going to start by highlighting findings related to student supervised clinical experiences. <clears throat> One of the key issues regarding clinical training is who supervises students. These data describe uh, respiratory care director responses to the statewide survey. We can see that nearly 70% of directors reported that a designated clinical instructor from the student's program is on site working with students no more frequently than occasionally. Underscoring this point, 
when RC directors were asked to choose a scenario that best describes how supervision of students' clinical training is organized, nearly half indicated that students simply train with whichever staff therapist is available on the day the student is on site. These survey findings were corroborated by the interviews with education directors. With only two exceptions, education directors described scenarios in which program faculty had limited contact with students in the clinical setting. It ranged from as infrequently as uh, a few hours with the student several times per week, th several times throughout the semester, to as much as three hours per week per student. These education directors acknowledged that there is definitely an element of randomness to the student preceptor relationship. <clears throat> These data are also from the statewide survey of RC directors. Approximately 60% of directors acknowledge that the lack of consistency in the clinical preceptor student relationship has a negative impact on the quality of instruction students receive. Similarly, over 80% of directors felt that having a designated clinical instructor who was always on site working with his or her students would improve the experience of clinical education. Several education directors raised the issue of students being paired with a staff RT who, for any number of reasons, finds the responsibility of training a student to be burdensome. Under those conditions, obviously, students are less likely to have an effective learning experience, particularly in comparison with clinical sites where precepting students is part of the RT job description. In addition, education directors raised concerns about students being precepted by RTs who do not keep up with current guidelines for standards of care or who don't practice using evidence-based medicine. Nearly three quarters of the surveyed RC directors whose facilities sponsor clinical training reported that their sites work with just one or two schools. And education directors reported that uh, they typically are able to place just one or two students at any one of their affiliated sites. In some cases, a program may have more than 20 different sites where they place their students, and these sites can be geographically dispersed. The main reason for these conditions is competition for clinical placements. According to education directors, increasingly there are multiple education programs competing for access to the same clinical sites. As a result, some programs need to rely on placements in sites where students are less likely to experience the full range of clinical pathology, procedures, and equipment used in respiratory care. Many of the RTs who participated in the focus groups felt that as a profession, Respiratory care would benefit from greater standardization of the clinical education students reserve, receive in terms of the number of hours spent in different clinical environments, more rigorous oversight of demonstration of procedural competence, and more explicit standards defining the specific clinical, in clinical interventions that students experience. In the next few slides, I'll address findings related to the educational preparation, generally educational preparation of new graduate RTs. <clears throat> These figures, uh, again, refer to uh, uh, respiratory care director responses to the statewide survey. Almost half of these directors disagreed with the statement that RT education programs provide thorough coverage of neonatal and pediatric care. 46% of directors disagreed that RT programs provide thorough coverage of pulmonary function testing. Two-thirds of directors disagreed that RT programs provide thorough coverage of sleep disorders and sleep studies. <clears throat> Education directors also identified sleep disorders and studies as well as advanced pulmonary function diagnostics, uh, for example, metabolic testing, cardiopulmonary exercise testing as areas that deserve greater emphasis in entry-level education programs. Several education directors also reported that students in their programs have little or no exposure to bronchoscopy procedures, noting that 
Not all students get to rotate through a clinical site that performs the procedure. So kind of emphasizing this variation in the scope of uh, clinical respiratory care that students experience depending on where they get to do their, their where they get placed. Uh. <clears throat> in terms of exposure to settings outside of inpatient care, and the development of competencies related to practice in non-acute care settings, the survey results indicated that few RC directors felt that these settings, uh, that these things are sufficiently emphasized by RT education programs. Now, it should be acknowledged that many RC directors expressed neutral views on these issues. This could reflect the fact that respiratory care, or respiratory therapy is predominantly practice in the inpatient acute care setting. Uh, that's just my theory. Uh, opportunities to practice in roles and settings outside of acute care are definitely emerging, but the profession, as you all know very well, is still heavily oriented towards inpatient hospital care. The interviews with education directors revealed that for most programs, Exposure to clinical practice outside of the inpatient acute care setting happens largely through didactic coursework, classroom discussions, and guest lectures. Every program director indicated a belief that it was important to expose students to non-acute care clinical settings. And every director reported that students in their programs have some opportunity for direct clinical experience in an alternative setting, though that experience in most cases is elective, not required. However, the extent of exposure to alternative settings varied substantially across the different programs. Focus group RTs cited preventive medicine, chronic care management as areas that are not well covered in entry level curricula and emphasize their importance given the need to educate patients and keep them from returning to the hospital. This was view viewed as one of the most critical skills in practice. Education directors identified critical thinking as the single most important competency area that needs to get more emphasis in entry-level respiratory therapy education. <clears throat> it underpins every facet of professional practice. Many of the education directors noted that employers consistently provide feedback indicating students' diagnostic skills are not where they should be. This view of underdeveloped diagnostic and clinical reasoning skills was echoed by RTs who participated in the focus groups. New graduates were seen as having conceptual knowledge of tests, procedures, equipment, modes of therapy, but not always able to apply the knowledge to direct patient care. There was a sense among RTs in the focus groups that the lack of critical thinking and clinical reasoning reflected too much teaching to the licensing exam in respiratory therapy education. Some of the other domains, uh, competency domains cited by RC directors, education directors, and uh, employed RTs as deserving greater emphasis in entry level education included communication skills, patient education, principles of evidence-based medicine, cultural competence, and professionalism. And this is, a very, this is a short list. There were quite a few, but uh, you can read more about it in the report. <clears throat> what was interesting to me was the view of professionalism included not only concepts such as attitude, reliability, respect for your colleagues, patients, and the work environment, but also an investment in the profession itself. This includes engagement with leadership on issues of departmental and institutional policy, as well as issues that broadly influence the practice of respiratory care. Finally, one of the questions we, we looked at was, to what extent are education programs responding to the passage of Senate Bill 525? And the answer is that uh, uh, education directors reported that students in their programs have limited, if any, exposure to the types of interventions articulated in SB 525 during their clinical rotations. The exception to this was the program at Loma Linda University, which is actively engaged in training students to the, the full extent of respiratory care's legal scope of practice 
in terms of both didactic and clinical content. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next two slides present findings from the analysis of stated competencies and required curricular content in the accreditation guidelines for entry-level respiratory therapy programs compared to physician assistant, physical therapy, baccalaureate level nursing, and nurse practitioner programs. All accrediting bodies stipulate that approved education programs develop a curriculum of sufficient depth and breadth to prepare graduates for professional practice. Accordingly, there are differences in the practical level of competence expected of graduates of the different education programs. Although there is definitely consistency across programs in terms of competency domains, it's important to keep in mind this caveat regarding differences in practical outcomes. <clears throat> COARC does not specify the direct care competency domains of palliative care or hospice end-of-life care, which are specified in three of the four comparison programs. In terms of non-direct care domains, COARC standards do not specify several competency domains that are part of the comparison standards, and these include quality improvement and patient safety, health informatics, information management, statistical analysis, financial organization of patient care services, scope and role of regulatory agencies, healthcare policy, supervision of personnel, and although <coughs> Uh, research methods and organizational systems leadership uh, are part of the COARC standards. There's a caveat that this applies only at the entry level BSRT level. The advanced practice competency domains are derived from the accreditation standards and guidelines for advanced practice nursing education programs, meaning nurse practitioner, nurse midwife, nurse anesthetist, and clinical nurse specialist programs. Specifically, these standards state that graduates of APN education programs must be prepared in three core competency domains, advanced health physical assessment, advanced physiology pathophysiology, and advanced pharmacology. The language used to describe competence in, the, in these areas served as the basis to identify the presence or lack of similar language in the accreditation standards of the comparison programs. Elements of the advanced health physical assessment and advanced physiology, pathophysiology domain, domains included risk assessment, emotional health evaluation, the ability to connect information gained through assessment to an underlying pathology or physiologic change across an individual's lifespan, and the ability to an analyze physiologic responses to illness and treatment modalities. Perhaps the most distinctive indicator of competence in these two domains is the ability to establish a differential diagnosis, which is the ability to differentiate between two or more conditions that share common symptoms based on myriad assessment data. The domain of advanced pharmacology entails an understanding of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in of broad categories of drugs and, and combines with other advanced practice competen competency domains to form the basis of a clinical practitioner's ability to assess a patient's physiologic response to pharmacotherapy. So competence in, in, in these related domains obviously are the foundation of a cl clinician's authority to prescribe drugs and medication. Now I want to point out that this analysis does not include the stated competencies and minimum curricular content as outlined in COARC accreditation standards for advanced practice respiratory therapy programs. And when you look at those standards, it's evident that the APRT is expected to have an educational background and clinical competence similar to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. However, the APRT role in clinical practice is not yet established. Uh, there's no credential that distinguishes the APRT as a clinician, and there are no currently 
any accredited APRT education programs in operation. So for those reasons, we didn't include it in the analysis. <clears throat> the next slides present findings related to minimum degree requirements in RT education. <clears throat> Two-thirds of surveyed respiratory care directors reported that asso the associate degree provides sufficient preparation for NTN to practice. However, RC directors were less unified about whether or not the AD program is too compressed and provides enough coverage of the core competencies in respiratory therapy. 36% of directors agreed with this notion, while 35% disagreed. One possible interpretation of these results is that while directors generally feel that <clears throat> the AD program covers the topics and content needed to prepare new grads to enter the workforce, at least some of these directors also feel that the coverage of some core content is sacrificed. Several of the RTs that participated in the focus groups expressed the view that although the AD program provides basic preparation for entry into practice, it's a starter education. These RTs acknowledge that new graduates are coming into the workforce still requiring significant on-the-job training as opposed to being work ready. Some of the support for the AD program expressed by RTs in the focus groups would be more accurately, accurately characterized as resistance to the idea of a bachelor's degree requirement. These RTs cited concerns. There would be no financial incentive tied to the bachelor's degree. There'd be no increase in potential earnings. <clears throat> More than 60% of directors, RC directors, who participated in the survey agreed with the notion that because of the technical complexity of respiratory care, the clinical knowledge it requires, and the broadening roles and responsibilities of RTs as care providers, respiratory therapy education needs to move to a four-year bachelor's degree. In addition, more than 60% of responding RC directors agreed that moving respiratory therapy education to the bachelor's degree level is necessary to create career, career opportunities in the profession. Finally, there was strong agreement among RC directors that respiratory therapy is perceived as a technical occupation and moving to a bachelor's degree requirement is necessary to raise the field's professional standing. The RTs who participated in the focus groups offered several reasons in support of a bachelor's degree requirement for entry into practice. Many saw value in additional didactic and clinical training believing it will produce RTs who are clinicians as opposed to technicians. Focus group participants also were sensitive to their standing relative to other health professionals, in particular registered nurses. They acknowledged that there is a trend in health profes professions education toward higher degrees. Many of the RTs were aware of the possibility that shifting to a bachelor's degree <coughs> requirement might function as a barrier to entry into the profession. It might reduce the supply of new entrants to the labor force. This was mainly seen as a positive outcome. Nine of the 10 education directors interviewed expressed support for requiring a bachelor's degree in respiratory therapy, believing it would allow more in-depth coverage of topics that are highly compressed in the current curriculum due to time constraints. And they also viewed it as the possibility of increased exposure to clinical procedures. But the most important factor driving support for bachelor, the bachelor's degree requirement among education directors was the expectation that it would encourage the development of critical thinking. <clears throat> The next slide presents findings from the comparison of curricular content and structure of two respiratory therapy educations in, pro, uh, in California. <clears throat> A well-regarded associate degree program in the state's community college system <clears throat> and the state's only entry-level bachelor's degree program at Loma Linda University. Excuse me. <clears> Thank <throat> you. 
<clears throat> oh, that's going to be really annoying. Christine's trying to help me out with my <clears throat> raspy speaking voice. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these are findings from the curricular analysis. Over the course of two years, students in the baccalaureate degree program at Loma Linda University a, a complete approximately one and a half times as many semester units as do students in the associate degree program. Much of the difference in credit volume occurs in the first year of the program. The curriculum at Loma Linda requires students to complete more than 41 semester units in the first year compared to a total of 22 units in the first year of the associate degree program. There is a substantial difference in the number of hours spent in supervised clinical training and the number of semester units that are laboratory based between the two programs. Students in the Loma Linda Baccalaureate program complete 1,200 hours of clinical training compared to 850 hours for students in the AD program. And that's about average, having spoken to the, you know, across the 10 different programs that we interviewed. Uh, you know, anywhere from, I think the range was from as few as around 6, 650 to the high, which was Loma Linda at 1250. So eight, 850 is right about in, at the median. <clears throat> in addition to differences in, in the number of clinical hours and lab uh, units, uh, students in the Loma Linda program complete more than twice as many, oh, I said that, sorry. Oops, twice as many lab, com lab uh, hours. <clears throat> students in the baccalaureate program in Loma Linda complete more than twice as many semester units related to pathology and pathophysiology compared to students in the AD program. And the Loma Linda students complete coursework in six different content areas, including statistics and research methods, pulmonary rehabilitation, case management, leadership that simply are not a part of the AD program's curriculum. Now, another curricular feature that distinguished the baccalaureate program at Loma Linda from the AD program in the community college system concerns how content is organized. Uh, as <coughs> it's uh, common in the AD program for a single course to combine multiple content areas. For example, a single course called Principles of Respiratory Care uh, it might include content related to patient assessment, diagnostic testing, pathophysiology, and elements of pharmacology. The baccalaureate program at Loma Linda is more likely to structure courses to focus on a single topic, whether theoretical or the development of technical skills. So as we were developing this heuristic model to, to look at how to compare the content in the curricula, uh, our assumption was that coursework that focuses on a single concept allows for a more developed understanding of that concept. For example, it's presumed that a two-semester unit course focused only on pulmonary function methods will provide greater depth and breadth of content related to the topic compared to a three-semester unit course covering cardiovascular disease and related pharmacology treatment of acute coronary syndrome and related disorders, and monitoring techniques that include, among others, pulmonary function testing. So there are 16 more single topic courses in the baccalaureate degree cu curriculum by comparison with the AD program, ranging from conceptual and applied knowledge to discrete skills and development. The next uh, few slides describe findings related to issues of professional practice. These include the use of therapist-driven protocols, granting RTs the authority to prescribe therapy per protocol, continuing education requirements, education directors' perceptions of labor market conditions faced by new graduates, and RTs' view of critical workforce, critical professional issues. <clears throat> A therapist-driven protocol was defined as the initiation or modification of a patient care plan following a predetermined structured set of physician orders, instructions, or interventions in which a therapist is allowed to initiate, discontinue, refine, transition, or restart therapy as 
dictated by the patient's medical condition. So using this definition, approximately 75% of RSC directors uh, who responded to the statewide survey indicated that the facilities they represented utilize at least one therapist-driven protocol as defined. Weaning, oxygen management, ventilator setup and management protocols are utilized by more than 60% of the facilities represented by these data. In contrast, use of uh, medica medication selection, <clears throat> emergency room care, nitric oxide administration, and COPD management protocols were reported by less than one-third of represented facilities. RC directors reported that if the protocol is in place, a majority of the uh, a majority of facilities apply the protocol to its intended pop patient population more than 75% of the time. So we asked them, <clears throat> if you have this protocol, how often do you use it? Does it get applied to less than 25% of the patient population, 25 to 75%, or more than 75%? So. The, these data indicate that <clears throat> if the protocol is in place, it gets used. Uh, the exception to this was nitric oxide administration, which uh, rarely gets uh, applied to the patient population for which it's intended, and you all would probably have a much better sense of why that might be the case. <clears throat> RC director survey responses indicated a widespread perception that medical directors and medical executive committees support the use of therapist-driven protocols. 72% of directors agreed with the statement, the medical director of my department is supportive of the use of respiratory driven, res therapist driven protocols. 60% of directors agreed with the statement, the medical executive committee at my facility is supportive of therapist driven protocols. Nearly 90% of directors agreed with the statement, Respiratory therapists should be allowed to prescribe therapy, including medications, per protocol within the scope of practice. Only 30% of directors felt that granting RTs the authority to prescribe uh, therapy per protocol should either require a bachelor's degree or be reserved for an advanced practice RT that is separately licensed and credentialed. Now, these views were largely echoed by uh, practicing RTs who participated in the focus groups. There was near unanimous support for the notion that therapists be allowed to prescribe therapy and medication per protocol. However, some RTs supported the idea that prescriptive authority be conditioned on additional degree-based degree education. Others felt it could be regulated through additional certification. Still others held the view that competency could simply be demonstrated on the job and signed off by the medical director. So RTs also framed the value uh, of having the authority to evaluate and treat per protocol in different ways. For some, it was all about efficiency of care. You know, I think there were many comments along the lines of it would be awesome because we wouldn't have to call the physician every time we wanted to initiate uh, therapy when it's not necessary. <clears throat> However, there's, there's definitely a view in the practicing RT community that uh, prescriptive authority is that opportunity to, to define the advanced practitioner uh, with a distinct scope of practice that is separately licensed and credentialed. Uh, the reference point for these RTs was the nurse practitioner and the physician assistant. Uh, so <clears throat> given this uh, uh, sort of unanimous uh, view across the different stakeholder groups that yes, RTs should be allowed to evaluate and treat for protocol almost everybody expected there would be resistance from physicians and registered nurses, that there would be issues related to insurance and liability, that these were the potential obstacles that uh, you, would, you would encounter. So <clears throat> I guess in short, the conditions under which RTs would be allowed to evaluate and treat per protocol, uh, the mechanism that establishes that authority, and the potential ob obstacles to its implement implementation are, are definitely issues that warrant further study. 
RC directors express strong support for the idea of establishing core continuing education requirements for all respiratory therapists, regardless of specialty or clinical practice area. 61% of directors agreed with the statement, there should be core continuing education courses that all respiratory therapists are required to complete, regardless of clinical specialty. In general, the focus group RTs also expressed support for the idea of establishing core requirements in continuing ed. A small number of RTs raised concerns over how having that requirement might limit their opportunities to pursue continuing education related to their practice areas. <clears throat> but almost everyone saw it as uh, having the potential to develop a strong, stronger professional norms and stronger expectations. <clears throat> Education directors were asked to share their perception of the labor market conditions faced by new graduates of their programs. Uh, the views they express suggest that there are regional, difference in, in regional differences in new graduates' prospects for employment. Um, I think in the Bay Area, the few education directors that we talked, out, talked to felt like things had improved recently uh, and s hypothesized that maybe uh, given the sort of improvement overall in the economy that some of the older RTs were going ahead and retiring. Uh, a program director in the greater Sacramento area offered a more qualified view of labor market conditions faced by new grads, stating that <clears throat> there are a lot of jobs out there but students need to be prepared to take a job that's not in the acute care setting. In contrast, program directors that we spoke to in the LA and San Diego areas, as well as the Inland Empire and the Central Valley regions, describe labor markets in which it's very challenging for new graduates to find employment. Directors reported that <clears throat> these markets are saturated with experienced RTs and, and indicated that even with open positions, <clears throat> Hospitals are reluctant to hire new grads because they're confident they're going to find a more experienced RT. Several directors reported that they just flat out encouraged their grads to leave California in search of employment. They pointed to growth in the number of respiratory therapy education programs as the principal factor responsible for these challenging labor market conditions. <clears throat> RTs who participated in the focus groups were asked to identify from their perspective the most critical professional issues facing respiratory therapy. <clears throat> professional standing was cited by most RTs, noting that physicians and RNs in particular show a lack of respect for the role of RTs. Many RTs cited need for professional development opportunities beyond the model of stepwise advances within the department where the associated pay differentials are mainly marginal. There was a strong sense that RTs need to push for practicing to the full extent of their scope of practice, but that efforts need to be tied to defining new professional roles for RTs that create opportunities for advancement and incentivize the investment in additional education and training. <clears throat> Several RTs identified staffing acuity as an important issue, noting that the number of patients they're caring for has increased dramatically, and there are no clear guidelines around patient safety as relates to RT patient panels. <clears throat> it was suggested that the time has come for an RT to patient staffing ratio akin to California's minimum nurse, passion, minimum nurse staffing ratio. <clears throat> Other RTs cited the flood of new graduates entering the field as contributing to a very challenging labor market in terms of opportunity for regular employment, not per diem employment. <clears throat> One RT described it as precarious employment. There's a common perception uh, that RTs need to start their careers in critical care where you learn to do everything and then you can think about moving to a less acute practice area if that's what you want to do. So there's a lot of concern that when new grads aren't able to find opportunities in critical care settings over time, they become second-class therapists for that lack of experience. So just to wrap up, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of information in this report. I clearly skipped over some of it. Um, these were, in my view, kind of the big ticket items that stood out. Uh, quality of, uh, of respiratory therapy students' clinical training lacks consistency. 
there, it's a real issue uh, that students don't get access to clinical settings where you get the full range of pathology and therapies and you work with experienced professionals who really r reference the evidence base in all of their clinical decision making. Uh, critical thinking and clinical reasoning, they need to be emphasized to a much greater extent in RT education. Again and again, this issue came up that students' ability, new grads' ability to connect what they've learned to the patient that's in front of them, it's not there. There's too much on the job uh, training that's required. There's definitely widespread support for establishing the BSRT as a minimum degree requirement for ent entry into practice. Um, there will be some administrative challenges if that's the de decision that's reached. Uh, one section that, you know, one question that we asked education directors that I didn't really highlight here was, what are the challenges that you would face if, you tra if your program had to transition to the BSRT? And predictably, they're around administrative uh, burdens. The, you know, uh, RT, uh, the faculty, the staff that support RT education, uh, they're typically, you know, it's, it's a director, a clinical director, and a couple of staff, so that's a real concern. A second issue is, do, is there enough trained faculty to, to, to make that transition? Uh, there's widespread support for granting RT's authority to evaluate and treat per protocol. As I mentioned, uh, how you get there, you know, how it's defined, the mechanism that, that authorizes it, the political uh, barriers that you're going to encounter as you try to establish that authority are legitimate. And finally, uh, the proliferation of RT education programs is seen as negatively impacting new graduate employment opportunities. And frankly, a lot of RTs feel like every single RT had a, had a, a school in mind that was just not doing a good job educating their students. Um, I know that this is in, it veers into, uh, you know, restraint of trade issues in terms of co trying to put a cap on the number of, of programs, but across the board, everybody felt like this is a, it's a pretty serious issue um, that needs, uh, I don't know if it needs more attention, but it's not going away. So thanks very much. Uh, and uh, I guess we're going to have some time for discussion. That was, <clears throat> you know, for a lot of information, that was an excellent presentation. For a lot of information, and there's a lot of information in here that relates to many of the items in the background and how it was achieved. And, and I implore everyone to reread it again and get the kernels of knowledge that were arduously collected in order to bring out these points and these conclusions in uh, this report. Um, I, I will open up the uh, discussion and, and comments about the report and first I'll ask if there's Anyone from the audience who would like to come up and make a comment or uh, have something to say about the report or any of the conclusions that were stated? Mm. Having no comments uh, from uh, people from the board, are there uh, issues they would like to talk, Dr. Harmon? Oh, okay. Hi. Yes, very complete report. For someone who's not a respiratory care therapist, you educated me a lot about the program and the education, et cetera. What I found was lacking, and I'm not sure if it was part of your charge to look at this, is I, I didn't see any um, interaction with students. There are no student interviews, and I feel that sometimes you can learn a lot from actually talking to students. I know when I review medical schools as part of the medical board, we get a lot more information from, um, from interviewing students, how they interact with faculty, the types of faculty, the types of preceptors. I didn't see any, um, anything in here about how schools evaluate the preceptor's performance. 
I mean, things like that. And again, I'm not sure if that was the charge that you were supposed to do, but I'd like for you to, if you could comment on the lack of, of interaction with the students and how they felt. <clears throat> it would have been a very valuable contribution to the report, no doubt, and would have been uh, revealed just a lot more nuance to the study. <clears throat> it was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, <clears throat> it wasn't part of our, our scope, uh, I'm meaning in, in terms of the direction we received. Uh, I would say that it's <clears throat> more time intensive to connect with students and, and schedule that kind of formal uh, uh, interview. Um, but to be, to be quite honest, <clears throat> it just wasn't a stakeholder a colder group that we, we focused on. I mean, it's, it's, you make a good point, and I don't really have um, a reasoned explanation for why they were excluded. It's, uh, it, as, you, as you can tell by the volume of information generated in the report, it was a big, sprawling, multi-component study. And <clears throat> I hope we did a fair job of, of really keeping it as focused as possible. Um, but the truth is, we just didn't talk to students. And it's a good point that you raise. <clears throat> is there, if there was an opportunity to go further, let's say if there was. Oh, absolutely. Students really have to be part of this equation, I think. For me, you learn so much, sometimes more, about what's going on in the institutions and yeah. what they need than talking to people yeah. that are so removed from, from well, their I, environment. Well, I will, I will qualify my response by saying that when we uh, conducted the focus groups, and we, we were very, very deliberate in that process, not only to make sure that we talked to practicing RTs from all parts of the state uh, who practice, we tried to capture as much variation in practice setting as possible, but critically, we really tried to get a range of experience. We really did take care to not just take anybody who was willing to do it, which is one of the reasons why it was such a, a challenge, but we, we had uh, RTs who were one year out of their program, three years out of their program, six years out of their program, in addition to those people who had been in the field for decades. So there's probably some perspective of that very recent graduate, you know, or not far removed from the program reflected in those focus group uh, findings. Um, I want to thank you for this workforce study. It, it was very good. But the question I have regards uh, respiratory therapists who were trained in other countries and then came here and took the licensing exam. Are there any? And what kind of degrees did they bring with them when they came to this country? I guess the foreign graduates can only uh, sit for exams if they've come from approved schools here in the United States and that their curriculum has been approved by a current co school that it meets the standards, the minimum standards, and there's usually things that they have to take. Most of the foreign graduates come out with a BS degree, but uh, have to usually take additional courses within a school here in the United States in order to be eligible to sit for the exam. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I can see you've done a lot of work on this and I appreciate it. But I have a, a couple of comments to make. On page 46, it says the single topic courses by degree program. Um, I went to an associate, I have an associate science degree in respiratory therapy. and from mechanical ventilation down to 12 lead EKG. All those things were in my program. So, I mean, to think that you can be a respiratory care practitioner and not be taught mechanical ventilation is crazy. So I don't know where you got that information from, but I think most schools teach all of those things. 
I agree with you. Yeah, so, but that's not what's in your. Um, the, what, what we were trying to describe, and again, this is going back to the assumptions we made in developing this, this model for interpreting information, was that a single course focused on that single subject. So it's not to say that AD programs don't cover that content. It's embedded in a course that covers a range of topics. Of course, you can't practice respiratory therapy without learning uh, 12 DDKG, without learning mechanical ventilation. The idea was, or the our assumption, to sort of this is a this is potentially a, a, a an important distinction in the in the experience that didactic experience and uh, that. Um, BSRT students at Loma Linda have c as compared to uh, you know a well-regarded two-year degree program the report does not say that uh, there is qualifying language in the report I, we definitely do not say that AD programs don't have any of this content what we're saying is that our assumption is that when you have a single course focus on a single topic a single course in 12 lead EKG, a single course in mechanical ventilation, that is potentially allows a student to get into that content at a greater depth than when you have a course that covers a range of, of content and you get, you get trained in that, but uh, it's, you know, it, to, your pushback is legitimate. It may not be, you know, people who know more about how respiratory therapy education is structured, uh, you know, it may be a legitimate criticism. This is not a useful way to look at the differences in course content in this particular case. We thought it may have some application. We thought it might be important as a distinguishing feature of the BSRT versus the two-year program. Maybe we were wrong. I'd like um, to make... Uh, oh, and then I had one other comment. Sorry. So, um, you call this technicians, we're not, we're respiratory care practitioners. And I think, you know, that's my kind of pushback. I don't like to be called a technician, that's not what I am. I'm not a, a knob turner. Um, I've had critical thinking skills and we're practitioners. The other thing that, um, I don't know if you, you asked, like the directors, will they give a pay increase? for someone going and get their bachelor's degree, and will they also adjust their schedule so they can go back and get their bachelor's while they're practicing? Excellent points. Because that, that, you know, a lot of people want to get it, and some of them are doing it, but... Excellent points. You know, the staff schedules them to work on days they're supposed to be in school. No, you, you're, you're uh, raising really important points. Um, Thank you. And to be, to be fair, I'm, we did not call anybody a technician. What we're saying is that among the stakeholder groups that we interviewed and, and surveyed, they all acknowledged that there is a perception of respiratory therapy being a technical occupation. There is a perception among the focus RTs who participated in the focus groups that their professional peers don't respect the l level of clinical knowledge and expertise that they, that they have. Um, and, and they attributed that largely to uh, the history of respiratory therapy, uh, the fact that it's still a two-year degree program. Um, so it's kind of the outsider's perception of respiratory therapy. Um, it is not our perspective on respiratory therapy. Okay. And Thank you. I just wanted to also comment on your, your second point about the pay differential. It's, it's super important. And no, there is no pay differential. It's a big issue, and it's going to be, I, I don't know, you know, there's, there's a lot of support for the BSRT. Everybody would like it to be associated with opportunities for professional advancement and, and a pay differential. But there is also uh, a, a widely held perception that it's needed for uh, non-pecuniary reasons, non-reasons not related to financial gain, for professional standing. Uh, most critically professional standing and that, that the profession in order to sort of capitalize on what appear to be emerging roles for RTs to play that that degree credential matters it's maybe political more than anything else but see nurses get a pay increase every time they get a new credential or or a new degree whereas respiratory care practitioners it's like well it's on your own 
with one of the really interesting findings from your was staff. So it's you know it's like I think it's a wonderful idea. I think it's where we need to go. Right. Um, but our staffs have to support us. Most and definitely. Currently, at least the staff where I work does not support it. A couple of uh, points. Wait. I, I, uh, one one was when we talk about a technical profession. It's basically the definition of the federal government saying that uh, one of the reasons we're struggling to try to get Medicare reimbursement right. and all right. those things to, is that we're not considered a professional group because we only have an associate's degree, not a bachelor's degree. So from a federal government standpoint, it's viewed as a technical profession, not as a technician. The other, the other point which uh, I'd like to make is that COARC, even for the baccalaureate programs, when they came out with their information, just made it a sort of a three-legged stool. Research, education, and management are the three areas which COARC will focus on relative to granting after 2018 baccalaureate programs. There's no requirement in that program, in those programs for the baccalaureate program, for any additional clinical education. And even when they're talking about an advanced practice, they're talking about a master's level program. And some programs in the United States, I think, I believe there's now three, that you can go as a registered therapist without a baccalaureate degree straight into a master's program. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, one of the impediments that I see relative to advancement of respiratory care in the baccalaureate program is information that came out of the report which said that I believe it was 60% of those people who are directors or managers of respiratory care have not gotten any additional degrees beyond their diploma or, certif or, or associate's degree. So those people who are in the management haven't even taken advantage of any advanced degree, whether it be in respiratory care or healthcare administration. That's accurate. You, you. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, this is an interesting report, but I think the comment, uh, the thing I agree with most is what Dr. Lewis said. So you did a top-down report from the people who would like their workers to do more of their work, do more of their job, and have more training at their expense. Well, the fact of the matter is what's happening in society is this is a national trend. We're no different than anybody else. True. Nobody wants to train. Everybody wants a perfect person to come in. It was just a few decades ago that all occupations you, you just took, if a person had a master's degree, they weren't necessarily expected to perform the job. Didn't make it, if you became a journey person in an occupation, whatever it was, you're in that first step. So you don't know your job. So any, uh, anything that says, a, that criticizes a person when they first start is because that's what society is doing now. Everything is training, retraining, and the employers don't want to retrain it at their expense. Everyone's going for grants. All, everybody's looking for government uh, handout where it used to be they would do the training. And everybody's requiring training statewide or whatever the occupation is. So I look at this as like a candy store for uh, the, uh, the top of the food chain, the directors, the supervisors. And uh, uh, naturally, uh, uh, there's not a surprise answer in here to me. I could have probably predicted closer to the percentages with not, and knowing the occupation a lot less than anybody else, I'm a public member, so I don't know the occupation that good, but I could have figured, figured out from the question what the answer was going to be. So it's a nice report. It's a lot of time spent. Uh, uh, every industry probably would come out with almost the same thing, regardless of what the industry was. Yes, we want more, and yes, we don't want to pay for it, and yes, we want it at your expense, and uh, that's just the way society is going. So um, uh, it's interesting that you know, some people are very, uh, I, I, in, in occupations like uh, uh, that I've dealt with, firefighters and trades, some people don't want to be a foreman. Some people don't want to be a lieutenant. Some people don't want to be a captain. 
Some people want to stay at their occupation. I'll bet you most respiratory care therapists like their occupation, they chose it, and they're happy with it. And uh, to get the impression that everybody has to move on, it just doesn't happen. Uh, police officers, another one, some of them just stay a patrolman their whole life and they retire happy and that's all they wanted to do. So I'm not really criticizing anything that was done. I'm just saying, if you had a report, like Dr. Lewis said, from the bottom up, from the workers, you could get a whole different perspective that would show maybe there's not enough um, uh, being for them to learn critical thinking when they first start or uh, any of the other uh, suggestions that fall there. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a long report. I thought we did a, <laughs> I appreciate I, pre, you know, I appreciate your brevity, like uh, the chair Roth said, for you to, to do that brief report on, the, uh, on the, as you did to us was very good because the study in this, I think we, we, we pretty much know what it was. But it's a, it's a good report. I appreciate it and thank you. Yeah, I just I won't dispute any of your uh, commentary. I, I'm just going to push back on the notion that this is a top-down report. The bulk of the people, well, there were the statewide survey of RC directors was significant, but we, the focus groups with practicing RTs, these were people who are specifically do not work in managerial or supervisory or director roles. So that's the workforce. That's the only thing I'll push back on. Otherwise, your uh, claims are, your comments are, I, yeah, they're legitimate. I, w I want to reiterate one thing that was just said. SB 850, which is the pilot program that allows for the community college to uh, start up a baccalaureate program, uh, and the two programs for the state that have been approved to do that are specifically stated to be a two plus two and not like Loma Linda, which is a four-year school, specifically for the reason that there are those students that choose to exit at the end of the associate program and not necessarily go on for this two more years to earn a baccalaureate program. So from the community college standpoint, they understand the need on the curriculum development side, just as was stated, those things that are necessary that have been underutilized within the associate program because it's too compressed to try to get everything in in the time for the associate program. And it would allow for people to be able to go on and spend two more years or 19 months really to get a baccalaureate degree in areas, just as stated in the report, that are not covered in the associate program. For those people who do want to advance their skills to go into case management, to go into research, to go into any of the specialty areas that were stated that were in the low teens as percentages that were represented. So uh, that's where the bridge is for, and hopefully, the six-year pilot program will become a permanent program and more schools will be able to move on and be able to do that. Tom, did you want to make a comment? Okay, so. <laughs> so uh, the complaint is that the RCPs are not well prepared to enter practice. The fa well, I'm a faculty member at one of the colleges, Ohlone College in Newark, and uh, we pack that two-year program full of material to try to prepare the therapist for entering clinical practice. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it demonstrates that an associate degree program does not have enough time to prepare the therapist to the level that employers want. It, it'll be the bachelor's degree program that gives them the full length of education they need to be uh, serious serious critical care critical thinking practitioners at the acute care level and so 
I know that coming from my past, we had a, a workforce shortage. We couldn't find enough therapists to, to hire, to put on to uh, take care of our patients. Well, now it's reversed. Now we've got a lot of uh, programs pumping out uh, 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 students to go into practice uh, who are not fully prepared to enter the workforce. And so that's created a problem for us. We've solved our workforce problem, but now we have a depth of knowledge deficiency in the students that are coming out of the programs. And so uh, I really believe that for a number of the points that you had on the board, advancements in professionalism, uh, respect from nurses and physicians, uh, getting adequately prepared to uh, work in the healthcare field at a higher level that we definitely need to go to the bachelor's degree level. And so I agree with your report, uh, most of it. There are some things that I would disagree with because I was a director uh, of hospitals, RT departments for 40 years. And now I'm a faculty member in the college. I've been a clinical instructor. I supervised my students full time. I did not pass them off to the 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 the, the, uh, the trainer from the the yeah. hospital department. Sure. Um, and so, like I say, we need to we need to jump up the quantum to the bachelor's degree degree level to advance our profession and receive the respect that we, that I believe that we're due because we play a vital role in acute care. Yeah, so. I, would, I would just respond by saying, um, I really tried very hard not to present this in a way that makes it seem like this, these, are, this is my, these are my thoughts on these subjects. We were gathering the perceptions and opinions of these different stakeholders. Um, and, you know, another fair point is to acknowledge that we didn't talk to every single RT in practice. We did not talk to every single uh, uh, director of services. We did not talk to every single education program. These are a sampling. Uh, there is some, there's a phenomenon called uh, uh, theme saturation and when you do research. And we do feel like we, we reached that point where the themes we were hearing from people were the same themes. So we felt like, you know, in some sense, this is a re represent, these ideas are representative of a pretty wide uh, group of stakeholders out there. But, uh, you know, it's not, it's not absolutely, it doesn't entirely define every single experience that a student has in their program or uh, a director's view of their workforce. Um, so that's just, that is true. A comment about the, makeup of our profession here in California, only one-third of our practitioners are registered therapists. Two-thirds are only certified therapists. Now the requirement once the level one schools ended in 2002 and all graduates of all schools in California after that point trained all students to be at the level to be able to sit for the licensing exam for as being a registered respiratory therapist. And yet as a profession, only a minority of our therapists within this state are registered therapists. So there's, there really is a lack of uh, concern, I think, for the therapist who says, I graduated I, I took the CRT, I could get a job and not advance themselves as part of the profession. And I think part of the profession also has its own identity crisis in as much as the membership of the professional organizations that represent respiratory care, both the State Society and the National AARC are well underrepresented relative to the number of practitioners that are currently both in California and in national. So when we come up against issues 
It's only very recently that the ARC has started to turn the corner relative to even looking at RRT as the minimum and baccalaureate and are currently doing various surveys around the country to gauge the practitioners to how they are. That, you know, we need to be ahead of the curve relative to that, like we always are, and, and try to move forward and see if we make a commitment to take a strong stand relative to those things, then things will follow rather than waiting for other outside organizations or outside things outside of the state to, uh, you know, force us to make changes. Yes, Sam. Well, well I, I read this on the plane initially. A little light reading. That study, and I, I applaud your work. But, you know, like in, in any profession, like I've learned, like the chairman said about the one-thirds, and, you know, it's sort of divided how the, these uh, professionals are pretty much classified. I mean, one of the things I'm looking at, uh, you know, when you, when you leave college or academia or leave, you know, the, the books and the theory, I mean, most of the things are learned actually on job or perhaps on their peer uh, directly who is guiding you through the process of, you know, hands-on training, it's called. So, you know, I spent 10 years in academia, you know. I came out, you know. Uh, it, it was a different world where you were, you know, applying for jobs and you were working in a, in a setting where you were asked to do things and you would think twice, you know. So in this case, we're talking about, you know, practically a profession that deals with health and people's lives. So just like a, 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 an MD or, you know, primary uh, practitioner, they go through a, an extensive residency and so forth, right? Yes. In order, so in this case, don't they have similar setting where they can perhaps, you know, whether in academia, like, uh, you know, uh, my colleague mentioned, like they can have a specific program where you graduate this, whether the associate level or the bachelor level, you will actually conduct similar concept to residency where you go for given hours or so forth like clinical practice in hours where you complete this yeah. you become more familiar yeah. obviously on job you'll carry on i mean this is what's concerning and i see that most of these uh, surveys you conducted and i do understand these are uh, independent of everything your opinion on some cases where you have sort of summarized it but i still look at the surveys where i'm sure they're accurate and, and as I see, it's like minimal engagement by their peers who are given in a facility where they work. So, and, yeah. uh, and you know, I think the industry where they say they have the enough lobby on national level or the state, but I still think it's a huge industry. I mean, given the facts of, and also its history. So uh, this is what I don't really connect the dots where, how come it has not been uh, mandated or required that given so much that uh, practitioners are guided by someone who's been in the industry, who's taken role at a given facility, or has a responsibility of teaching the skills or know-how to the students. So this is where... Well, I... You know, there, there is... There is certainly a lot of interest we heard from, uh, especially on the educator side and the, the, the through the focus groups with RTs about the notion of a, a sort of um, postgraduate residency. You know, something similar to what uh, there's an, um, you know, registered nursing is uh, has made a lot of strides towards establishing residency programs. So these are clinical training programs that are open. It's not just your school. You know, it's it's you're essentially applying to participate in them. So, I mean, that's certainly a model of training that, that uh, uh, you know, given, I don't know how realistic it is given limited resources, but it certainly would be an effective way to make sure that uh, you're getting students, new graduates, the clinical exposure that they, that they require. Um, I, something you said uh, made me think about how just going back to this theme about um, schools programs compete really hard to find placements for their students these days 
it's there are a lot of schools that they that that need to find placements for their students and in in some sense uh and this is my opinion these are my views that i'm expressing right now this is not this is not something that somebody said to me but my perception of it was that you you're at risk of of having a kind of a a two-tiered workforce you have the students that have access to uh, academic medical centers where you have the highest level of acuity of patient care and and a really sophisticated respiratory care department a champion in the department who's leading it you have a medical director who's highly engaged you have a lot of re you're surrounded by colleagues who are engaged in in uh, research and then you have students who are getting the bulk of their uh, clinical experiences in um, far you know where the, where the diversity of pathology is minimal, where the level of patient acuity is is much lower, where the, uh, the you know you, it's just not the same quality and caliber of of clinical experience. So I mean I think that's a real real issue. What, you know, kind of touching on what you're saying, like what you know, what's the problem? Why you know there should be more? You know, you get trained on the job, absolutely. Part of the supervise in some ways, it's uh, supervised clinical experiences are an analogy for for on-the-job training. It's a uh, it's part of the way towards a residency. But if you have such disparity in in the in the quality of those supervised clinical experiences, uh, that's a that's a significant workforce issue. There is one uh, program that addresses r specifically related to respiratory. And as you stated in your slide relative to neonatal and pediatric, there is a program at Stanford yeah. that enrolls respiratory for nine months, I believe it is. And it's a, a partially stipend internship yeah. so that they have students and who, upon graduation, are eligible to apply for jobs within the Stanford Health System. We, uh, I interviewed somebody at, uh, uh, I guess UCSF has swallowed it up now, but Benioff Children's over in Oakland, and she runs their, uh, she's a sleep specialist, and she, she, it's, for her at this point, it's just built into the cost of, of hiring the, the, she doesn't, she, she can only hire people who have almost no experience or, you know, no real uh, depth of knowledge in, in, in sleep. Uh, you know, but that's UCSF with a ton of resources and they can, they can do that. They can build in a really robust onboarding training program. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be the case uh, for a lot of, of, of other facilities. So this issue of on-the-job training and, and the demand for resources and time and, and, and staff that are, you know, staff that are asked to onboard and train and precept, and they don't get, they don't get paid. There's no compensation for them to take on that additional burden. So they're definitely the whole the, they're, they're significant workforce issues. The whole model of 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 uh, uh, the pipeline from education into practice definitely um, there are some challenges there. About. Fifteen years ago, the, the, what was very popular was career ladders and, and deciding that um, therapists who wanted to move within the profession could move in varying directions if they continually did certain things. One was education, one was precepting, one presenting research, doing things on a continual basis that a hospital could move forward and say, we could have a therapist one, two, three, four, you know, whatever. And, and then things got compressed and then it sort of fell apart. And it's no longer part of an active process. It also was a point of time where you could hire as a director, you could hire a therapist and, and give them a partial workload, have a mentor and ha have them be trained. You know, that model is just not a viable model anymore within the current healthcare system. So I think that that's why the directors themselves, when talking about having students that are not prepared, 
uh, and, and for the reasons that you expressed that now students are coming out and are expected on day one to take a full load and sometimes it's an overload of, of amount and, and have trouble coping with their ability to be able to do the work adequately and successfully, you know. I had another question. I wanted to know um, how did you pick the RCPs that you talked to? And also just a point, um, like I'm a person that I love having students, but um, where I work, we were taking students from three different colleges and they were there day and night and it got to a point where um, my coworkers were completely burnt out at having a student every single day, sometimes for a year or two. Um, and everything they do, you have to be with them the whole time. They're you know, doing under your license and you're trying to train them, but sometimes you just get burnt out and you need a break. And with as many students as we were taking, um, it wasn't possible to get a break and people were really angry about it. So it's like some people like students like me, some people really don't care to have students and they may not get as good a training as someone who enjoys doing it. but. Um, and like there's a glut of students out there that are looking for jobs. And um, like I said, three colleges coming days and nights. And it was a lot, it was a lot to ask. Yeah. But where, where did you, how, how did you pick your, your RCPs that you interviewed? <clears throat> uh, they, we took up, there were uh, 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 several different uh, uh, components to um, developing uh, uh, that group of RCs. Um, we reached out to uh, so directors who participated in the survey. We reached out to those directors and said, would you be willing to forward an invitation to participate in focus groups to RTs on your staff? We contacted uh, almost all of the uh, education programs and said, would you be willing to, it, for, the, for your clinical affiliates, those sites, would you be willing to make an introduction for us to somebody there who could facilitate recruitment of RTs? Um, we had a contact at, uh, wow, man, I'm gonna get there. there. It's part of SEIU. Um, so in the Central Valley, it was particularly challenging to find people and we did some, we used a connection within um, the union. Uh, so they did, again, just facilitated introductions. And then we used a screening process. We had a survey set up where they would plug in their information, like what area, of, of, what's your clinical practice area? How many years have you been doing this? Like what's your educational background? So that we could have some control over what that group looks like and make sure that we're representing, you know, the full range of practice areas, practice settings, and experience in respiratory therapy. Thank you. I'd like to uh, make a motion that uh, we accept this report as delivered in order to be able to uh, disseminate this information within our website and other interested parties to be at the, the largest uh, grasp of the situation to be able to help move the profession forward. Second. Any public comment? Any comment from anyone else on the board? I'll ask for a vote, please. Mary Ellen Early. Aye. Rebecca Franzoya. Aye. Michael Hardiman? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Judy McKeever? Aye. Sam Kabusha? Aye. Vice President Wagner? Aye. And President Roth? Aye. Thank you, Tim, for the presentation and your thoughts on the project. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Uh, we all, my team, myself, we learned an incredible amount about the profession and uh, if there's work to be done in the future, you know where to find us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number seven. Uh, if there's any public comment from anyone in the audience of items 
uh, not that were not on the agenda that they would like to make a comment about. Any board members who would like to make a comment of any item not on the agenda? Yes. Yes, I think we should acknowledge Judy, our director. This is her first day of retirement, <laughs> and she's here. Uh. Um, can I also say something? Um, I just I want to let the members know that we probably will be changing up our committees. I think um, you had mentioned that to me, President Roth, and so just look forward to that coming between now and the next board meeting, right? Again, part of uh, to reiterate uh, what Stephanie. Uh, said, uh, as you can see from the report and what we're going to go through looking for relative to the strategic planning, that we're going to need uh, much more input from the committee members moving forward to make the strategic plan into fruition. And so the executive committee will, and Stephanie will be reaching out to all of you to speak and to be part of a much more concerted effort to move the strategic items that we're going to be able to be talking about moving forward so we can be as successful as we were during the sunset thing when we presented to the legislature all the great things that this respiratory care board has done with the help of the staff and for all the board members. So thank you.